All right, thank you everybody for being here tonight. We'd like to make a start because we've got lots and lots of presenters to, to talk about some really exciting things in women's health. So the journey that we've come from in women's health and where we're looking forward to going. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, introduce myself. My name is Deb Virtue and I'm the Deputy Head of Department of Physiotherapy at the University of Melbourne. And to start with, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this event is taking place, the land of the Wurundjeri people, and pay respect to their elders, past, present, and their families, and warmly welcome any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people with us in person, or anyone that might be joining us online. So I'd like to welcome you all to this wonderful event to celebrate the career of Marg Sherbin in women's health and in physiotherapy generally and also um, to really learn from some of our expert panellists tonight um, about where they think the direction of uh, women's health, men's and pelvic health is going in the future. So I'd like to start the proceedings today by introducing um, Professor Bruce Thompson. If you could come up for us now, Bruce, and you can welcome and open your address. Thanks, Bruce. Thank you so much, and, and thank you so much for actually inviting me to uh, open this, just an amazing event. And, uh, and I've been given the wonderful job of actually reading out all about Marg, and, um, uh, which has been an extremely interesting read. So, Marg Sherburn was a long career of outstanding achievements, far more than time permits today. So this is actually only a brief uh, two-page in fine print. Um, summary of uh, her career so far, so we had to adopt a lot of it. Um, Marg graduated with a diploma in physiotherapy from Lincoln House in Melbourne in 1971 and went on to pursue a Bachelor of Applied Science, a postgraduate certificate in continence and pelvic floor rehabilitation, Masters of Women's Health and then Doctor of Philosophy investigating pelvic floor function in older women in 2007. Her academic career started soon after graduation, teaching at Lincoln Institute of Health Sciences. Her passion for physiotherapy led to academic roles in physiotherapy initially at La Trobe University before commencing here at the University of Melbourne in 1994, which was also the first year of the Bachelor of Physiotherapy program. Mark played an integral role in developing women's health curricula at undergraduate and also postgraduate levels over subsequent years. Marg has held a number of key clinical appointments, providing important leadership in public and private healthcare settings. Most notably, was she was manager of the physiotherapy department at the Royal Women's Hospital for a decade, where she facilitated the expansion of physiotherapy services into all clinical areas and special, specialist clinics. She has held positions on the APA National Advisory Council and as national chair of the Continents and Women's Health Physiotherapy Group. She has also supervised numerous masters and doctoral theses, published widely in peer-reviewed journals and con contributed to several book chapters in women's health uh, textbooks. She was also scientific editor of the Australian and New Zealand Continents Journal. Through her leadership and research, she has de developed an international, turn over the page, uh, <laughs> reputation and has been an invited speaker at many conferences and workshops locally and overseas. Marg was awarded the Woodward Family Medal of Excellence from the Royal Women's Hospital in 2015, an APA Victoria Branch Achievement Award for contribution to the profession in 2016, and the University of Melbourne Distinguished Service Medal in 2019. She was awarded the title of Fellow of the Australian College of Physiotherapy in 2010, and that's the highest level of expertise in continence in women's health. She continues to be active in clinical practice, teacher into the Master of Women's Health program here at the University of Melbourne, and as a mentor in the Australian College of Physiotherapy program. So congratulations, Marg, on your outstanding achievements, promoting the role of physiotherapy in women's health. And that's far too much of me. I'd much rather hear from Marg herself. Everyone, please give a round of applause. Well, thanks everybody, and thank you Professor Thompson for your very kind introduction. Um, I'd like, before I start on any um, history of where we have come from, I'd like to also to thank Tara and her committee for organising this event uh, to celebrate my passion, pelvic health and women's health. So I feel very honoured to be uh, a part of this celebration. 
So my role is to look back on what we've the what achievements we've made in pelvic health and women's health and men's health over the years. I thought we'd start where we're at today. So here at the University of Melbourne, we have a master's degree in pelvic health, which is accredited for titling within the APA. We, it has postgraduate certificates as exit points for those who don't want to do the full masters. We have a women's, men's and pelvic health a module as part of lifespan health in the entry to practice degree here. And we have an active pelvic health research team for masters and PhD students. Outside of this university, within the Australian APA, we have a, a pathway to women's, men's and pelvic health specialisation via the College of Physiotherapists. And as pelvic health physiotherapists, we've got strong connections to our National Continents Foundation, and it's notable that this event is happening in World Continents Week, it's part of choosing the date. We've got Australian physiotherapists uh, in international organisations, in particular the International Continent Society and the International Urogyne Association. There are so many opportunities for pelvic health physios in 2022. So, how did we get to this point? I'd like to weave my 52 years of being a physiotherapist with what was happening in physiotherapy as a whole and women's health in particular over these past 52 years. This is not a systematic review. <laughs> not even a good narrative review. There's no in-text citations, but there will be two references at the end of it. <laughs> this is a potted history of my career as it fits into the changes made in physiotherapy over the last 50 years. This means that there's going to be pertinent facts that I've neglected and the panel will have their own perspective over the last years. But as I said, this is not a systematic review. So I'll take things decade by decade and let's look back at the 1960s to start with. As Bruce, Bruce mentioned, I started as a first year student at Lincoln House in Swanston Street, which was a brand new building. Um, we had a three year diploma course and at the end of it, that my three year diploma, I was registered by the Masseurs Registration Board. There was not an opera or anything like that. At that time, there were no opportunities to go further within physio education or research. That was it, a diploma course. We had gurus like Jeff Maitland to guide out and change our practice, but little high-level high evidence. But there was women's health training in this undergrad diploma course, and it focused on obstetrics, which is where the women's health <coughs> uh, specialty, I guess, started. The wonderful Liz Berman was one of our inspiring teachers, and it was she who ignited my interest in women's health, though that interest lay very latent for a long time. And within the APA at that time, the national group was, or the, uh, was called the Obstetric Physiotherapy Group. More broadly, outside of physio education, there was changes in the attitudes to women. And the Nursing Mothers Association of Australia had been formed in 1964 with Liz Berman, our physio staff member from uh, Lincoln House, uh, being one of the founding six members who started this organisation. You might wonder, what a title, the Nursing Mothers Association. Well, why? The name represents the repressive censorship of the time uh, when, uh, in an era, era when formula feeding was the norm um, and when you could not mention words like breast or pregnant or nipple uh, and in wit written or over the airways. And FYI, the Nursing Mothers Association changed their name to the Australian Breastfeeding Association in 2001 when we could mention that word breast. <laughs> All students in our year uh, had to do a, the women's health or the obstetric clinical placement. And um, I was told that uh, the head of the physio department, I don't remember this, the head of the physio department at the women's even called the boys girls for her ease. <laughs> My memories of that placement were of us all sitting down at the old women's hospital where the physio was, department was in the basement, sitting on the floor, learning word for word the childbirth education, yeah, childbirth education screed. To pass the unit, you had to memorise it. Word for word, no deviation allowed. I also remember the very rules-based attitude to childbirth in those days. Babies went to the nursery. You stayed here, four-hour feeding. Postnatal classes were depressing as the poor women had to traipse down to the basement in their hospital gowns, babies were in the nursery. It's a time that's well gone. We did teach pelvic floor exercises though. We sat long sitting, with our ankles and knees crossed and 
you know, t- tighten every muscle up the inside, right up to the waist. <laughs> and that was pelvic floor training. <laughs> <laughs> Our ward work was focused predominantly on breathing, coughing and wriggling toes for the women who had caesarean sections. Less care was ne- needed for those who had a natural birth. Um, but there, there was a highlight of our clinical placement at the women's in those days, and that was that everybody was able to observe a birth. And I'll put in a very personal perspective here, this was not an immediate highlight for me. <laughs> Because my first birth that I ever observed was a woman who had a very traumatic birth, not that I knew it as a 19-year-old or 20-year-old at the time, but I do remember going home with a knot in my stomach and telling my mother that I was never going to have a baby, ever. (laughs) However, I had a wise tutor who encouraged me back into labour ward the next day, and I did see a more uh, normal, natural labour, less traumatic. So that was my world in the 1960s and uh, into the early 70s. Outside of this undergrad world that I inhabited, there were were world changes for physiotherapy as a whole. The World Confederation of Physical Therapy, WCPT, had held their first conference in Australia in 1966, where a motion to make physios first contact practitioners was defeated. But change was coming. So let's look at the 1970s. If physios were to become first contact practitioners, then our education had to reflect this. And so a degree course came into being, the Bachelor of Applied Science, physiotherapy in brackets. Lincoln House became Lincoln Institute, a home to many of the therapy courses, OT, speech, prosthetics and orthotics, etc., under the umbrella of the Victoria Institute of Colleges. In 1976, the APA submissions enabled a change of law, and by 1978, the WCPT finally agreed to first contact practitioner status. And we had our bachelor degree course ready. Our graduates were coming out with clinical reasoning. So what was I doing during the 70s while all this change was occurring outside? Well, in those days, to pay for our education, I was bonded to a country hospital for two years. So I trotted off to Warrigal, to West Gippsland Hospital, where I was the sole physio in the town. Warrigal was a town of about 3,000 people in those days. So I had a job at the hospital. Uh, but of course, childbirth education came easy. I knew the classes off by heart. I could go to the postnatal boards, I could, uh, wards, I could support women in labour. But I also did the footballers, and even greyhounds, Um, (laughs) did everything. What a wonderful job for a new grad. But I had to leave after my two years was up, so I donned a backpack with one of my girlfriends from uh, my uh, undergrad days and went away for a couple of years. On my travels, I had a hospital romance in Canada (laughs) with an English physio (laughs) who then travelled with me. He married me. And is stuck by me all these years, and he's here today. <laughs> Thanks, Neil. <laughs> so he came back to Melbourne, and Pat Kosh offered me a job at Lincoln Institute. And so my pathway in academia began. So I was only five years, four or five years out from graduation. I was back teaching, and my love was anatomy, kinesiology, biomechanics, exercise physiology. Nothing to do with women's health. I converted my diploma to the new Bachelor of Applied Science and then started a science degree here at the University of Melbourne, which I never finished because the 1980s came and my life was to change very suddenly when babies came along in the early 80s and I followed that well-worn path of other physios into women's health by having my own babies. So thank you, Liz and Tom. (laughs) But what an opportunity to combine my love of biomechanics and exercise and all things pre and postnatal to be involved in modifying exercise for pregnant and postnatal women. The 1980s was the real beginning of a fitness boom, uh, the beginnings of gyms that weren't male only. It was the birth of the fluoro, high cut, uh, uh, leotards, big hair, music. Uh, and so uh, th- those of you in the audience who weren't adults in the 1980s probably don't realise that the options that we have today weren't available back then. And I was a player in a government project to create a safe exercise environment for pregnant women. Uh, It was called the Active and Pregnant uh, Project. So that was the first big uh, funded project that I was ever involved in. It was a turning point in combining the fitness and obstetric worlds. And I became a director of a physiotherapy private practice called Changing Shape. And we ran exercise classes for pre and postnatal women all around Melbourne. And we did a lot of training of 
physios in not just the science of taking group exercise, but the art as well. What was happening outside of my world? There was turmoil in the physio education sphere. The Victoria Institute of Colleges was disbanded, and the therapy degree courses at Lincoln Institute were to enter the university system. It was decreed by the government that all the courses at Lincoln Institute were to go to La Trobe Uni. But not so. There are a couple of people who are in the audience today, and, another, and along with a whole group of strong physios and the APA, there were large protests. There were staff strikes. There was marching down Swanson Street with banners demanding that we go to the University of Melbourne uh, rather than La Trobe, because at La Trobe there was no established medical degree or biomedical sciences at that university at the time. So changes of that magnitude don't occur overnight, and it wasn't actually until 1991 that Professor Joan McMeekin became the inaugural uh, Professor of Physiotherapy here at the new University of Melbourne Physiotherapy School, and Gillian Webb and Liz Tully formed the leadership of this new school. Outside of the University of Melbourne in the, uh, the 1980s, um, the the Australian Continents and Women's Health, note the change of title, not obstetric anymore, Continents and Women's Health, uh, became more established within the APA. And the first Australian Journal of Physiotherapy paper on pelvic floor work was published in 1981. And the first uh, PhDs were awarded in the late 1980s to Wendy Bauer, our first PhD in Women's Health in Australia, uh, along with Pauline Chiarelli. This was the birth of research into the clinical effectiveness of pelvic floor muscle training in Australia. Pauline produced her book, Women's Waterworks. I'm sure every uh, pelvic floor physio in this room has read that, that book. And um, uh, Wendy led the paediatric continence research. We were forging links with the Continence Foundation and internationally, Pauline Chiarelli, uh, the English physio Joe Laycock and Norwegian physio Kari Bo represented physiotherapy within the International Continent Society. Let's go to the 1990s now. The new physio course here at the University of Melbourne was growing in stature and size. I came back to teaching here as a casual tutor, uh, teaching all things women's health now. Gone was the anatomy, the biomechanics, back into women's health. It was a four-day seminar. It was great to be back, I must say, and uh, I had an enthusiastic, enthusiastic band of clinical tutors, and we educated uh, students in all aspects of women's health. Gone were the days of just doing childbirth education. We did pre and postnatal, we did gynaecology, pre and post surgery, we did bone health, uh, breast health, uh, all sorts, everything, all in four days. <laughs> if, if that was the extent of our knowledge, think what it is now, uh, but that was a start. In the health system in the 90s, there was a growing realisation of the major role physiotherapists could play in pelvic floor rehab. More women were openly, openly talking to their clinicians about leaking, and a real need was perceived. So as more physiotherapists took to this practice, learning was done on the job. We observed the practice of others, and we met at each other's houses, training on each other. Um, that was it. That was how we then turned around and taught the new generation. We had Pauline Chiarelli's pelvic floor course in New South Wales, but travel wasn't as common in those days, and so that was the only formal training. Uh, the APA had some obstetric modules, uh, but there was no postgraduate qualification training. So three leading Melbourne clinicians, Helena Frawley, who's here tonight, Janet Chase and uh, Judy Frederick, approached Joan McMeekin to begin a postgraduate course in pelvic floor rehab. What a major step that would turn out to be. So many students and graduates of that course in this room today. Um, so the, thank you, Joan and Helena, for opening us to have a, a, being open to us having a qualification course. The first graduates of this course uh, emerged in 1998, um, and there are quite a few of that first cohort of us here tonight. We've become a really united professional group. <coughs> One of the big changes that happened almost overnight by us having a qualification course was the acceptance within the medical profession and within the health system that physiotherapists could play a part in pelvic floor rehab. It was, positions opened up magically, and particularly in the uh, government-run continence clinics and in public hospitals. We were accepted. It was amazing. From our PD courses to a qualification course, what a difference it made. The APA group was now named the Continents and Women's Health Group, 
and the Continents Foundation of Australia supported a physio group as a subgroup of its membership. We'd formed this P a pelvic floor group within the CFA to provide us with very specific PD since it was only open to graduates of this course. And this gr uh, group has grown exponentially since those early days of the 90s. And we have two of the leaders here tonight. We have Celia Bolton in the audience and Hayley Irving on the panel, uh, leaders of that group today. So let's turn to this century, to th the 2000s up to today. We had a pelvic floor course that was growing in complexity. It was growing in its reputation in the number of graduates. We had international students and international collaborations. Tick. Graduates of this course were becoming Australian and international leaders in the APA, the ICS and IUGA, teaching courses overseas and gaining a growing research reputation. Tick. But we were novice researchers at first. Luckily, we had really good mentors and supervisors of the statue of Mary Galea, of Joan McMeekin and Kim Bennell here actually at the University of Melbourne. Funding was and still is an issue, but we were creative with the use of the small amounts of money that we had. And we held money making projects too. Do you remember the excellence down under conferences? Mm -hmm. Apart from that fabulous name, <laughs> they were really good and they were a major source of much needed research funds. I look back at my first research project with pride. For novices, we undertook quite large projects and did them quite successfully. My first large project was the Continents and Coughing Project. Uh, it was funded by the CFA under the National Continents Management Strategy, and it had a large impact on the respiratory physio uh, regimes in terms of how to cough effectively without stressing the pelvic floor too much. And it's still ongoing in a modified form today at the Alfred. Now, the next part of this pres presentation focuses more on my personal journey through the mid-2000s, but I think it represents what was happening in physio. There was so much happening. It was like a bomb exploding with research and clinics and international uh, journeys and presentations, etc. So by, me, by <coughs> my telling you what I did, expand that and put yourselves in the picture. So where did I start to fit into this in the 2000s? I did a master's degree, as um, Bruce said, at the Key Centre of Women's Health, where I gained not only a master's degree, but I gained a huge appreciation and a broader understanding of women's health as a whole. Um, women's issues, and I have now, I got gained then and still have, an understanding of the need for much more gender equality in all aspects of society, not just health. A PhD came next, as one does here. And I have only the deepest gratitude to Professors Mary Galea <coughs> and to Kari Bo in Norway, who are my supervisors, for this major part of my life. As Mary often commented, she had difficulty pinning me down. She said, it was like chasing butterflies. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mary. I'm glad you <laughs> held me down. The journey was fascinating, and Helena and I studied quite a bit together. We had a momentous study week in Singapore one time with both Kari and Mary. They made us sit down and work for hours, and then we could go in the pool. We had to go back and do more work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where I had my first international conference presentation, with, and my PhD research was presented. I remember Kari going over my presentation in the um, presenter's room, saying, You've got too many words, too many slides. Why do you need that dot point? Why do you need that word? And I'm sure the students in the audience after this last two weeks of prax, uh, they go, why do you need use so many words? Don't, uh, the patients don't need so many words. So I'm still on that. that I got that from Kari. <laughs> From 2005 to 2015, I was at the Royal Women's Hospital heading up the physio department, and they were 10 really happy, productive years. During this time, we moved from the old hospital up in Swanson Street to the, the site in Flemington Road, and the physio came up out of the basement onto the first floor with all the ambulatory care clinics. We'd become an actual part of a busy hospital. Hooray! And I have to admit, the, the exponential growth of that department was done with a bit of creative accounting, because <laughs> there was always, never any money for more EFT or more equipment. However, we, we grew and we started clinics in chronic pelvic pain with the um, PCOS girls, with uh, gestational diabetes, with the drug and alcohol group. Uh, we understood where pelvic health could fit into all these other clinics. And uh, so the role of physio grew greatly at the women's 
and still is grown now and probably growing more. I, you know. And so we come to the last few years, the end of this talk. This new history probably doesn't seem really like much history because it's so recent. But changes in education and technology combined to become an evolution in, uh, to learning online. The Masters of Rehab Science was born here and in 2016 we had our first subject, Rehab for Women's Health. Since then, the Masters of Pelvic Health has developed uh, from that Rehab Science Masters as predominantly an online degree. And then we had a pandemic. What a difference a microscopic protein can make to the world of learning. Online learning's become the norm. We're still all learning to navigate this new form of teaching and learning, but we're gaining more confidence in preparation materials, in lesson planning and online assessments, and how to engage students effectively. But it's due to these changes that I feel it's time to pass the baton on to the next generation, those highly intelligent, motivated, young, enthusiastic, savvy young women out there, and men, if we could encourage them, that's not, not wedded to women there, uh, who can enact all these changes and progress pelvic health physiotherapy. And the rest of the session will be looking forward to how we can change in areas of research and teaching and clinical work. So as I prepared this talk, I marvelled at the changes that I've seen in my 50 years of being a physiotherapist. And I hope that I've inspired some next generations of young physios here tonight to forge ahead uh, with confidence, with enthusiasm, and not being daunted by the challenges. And create similarly large changes in your careers as well. So let's look to the future, and there will be a panel discussion looking at the future. Uh, I did say that there would be two references at the end of this talk. Here they come. First, I think that if you wanted to learn a lot more detail of the history of physiotherapy here at this university, you would do well to read Professor Joan McMeekin's book, Science in Their Hands. The chapter in particular on the era of 1980s when the tumult was going on, leaving Lincoln Institute and coming to this uh, university, the gestation of this school is a fascinating read. And for those who are interested in childbirth, I would recommend my other reference, which is a book called Sex and Suffering by Professor uh, McCallman, uh, Janet, Janet McCallman, um, which is the history of the Royal Women's Hospital and how childbirth has changed from those terrible years when there was no anaesthetics and no caesareans, uh, but patient-centred care was still considered uh, uh, their, their goal. So I, with that reference list and uh, some work for you to do, I now uh, wish you all joy and passion in your work and let's look to the future. Well, thank you so much, Marg. That was just so entertaining, as, as many of the conversations are with Marg. Um, and it's so lovely to hear uh, that so many people that have influenced you, your career are here with us in the audience today. And I, I really uh, would like to welcome so many faces that um, have had such a, an impact on your career. Um, we've got... Uh, Professor Mary Galea, Kathy Knorr, we have uh, Professor Jill Webb and Mac Joan McMeekin. Um, you know, you've, you've really influenced um, the world of physiotherapy and the women's health um, part of the profession. So thank you all for all of that as well. Marg, gosh, how are we going to follow that? <laughs> um, Forge ahead. So, yes, exactly. So we really want to be um, thinking about, well, where do we go with women's health? It's come so far in such a short period of time, hasn't it? So um, our panellists tonight are going to be talking to us about um, really where um, they have gone. And of course, my, my run sheet. Oh, here we go. Um, the... Um, where we're, we're really going with the future of women's health physio. So before we ask the panellists some specific questions, I'd just like to introduce them first of all. So first of all, on the end, I would like to in introduce Rowan Cockrell. And my, excuse me while I just find my introduction here. Uh, so Rowan is a nurse continent specialist and CEO of the Continents Foundation of Australia. 
Rowan's an advocate for the interests of Australians affected by or at risk of bladder and bowel control problems and pelvic floor dysfunction. And he's overseeing projects in national quality continent standards and other Department of Health programs. So we really thank you very much, Rowan, for being here this evening. Next to Rowan is Elise Fraser, who is an Australian Physiotherapy Association titled Continents and Women's Health Physiotherapist, that's a mouthful, <laughs> working in an advanced practice role in urogyne and obstetric perineal trauma at Mercy Hospital for Women and at Olympic Park Sports Medicine Centre. She coordinates the women's, men's and pelvic health physiotherapy programs at the University of Melbourne, having had that bat baton passed on from Marg. And next to Elise is Wendy Bauer, Associate Professor Wendy Bauer, who is a physio researcher at the University of Melbourne and a research lead at Melbourne Health, where one of her most recent projects has been the development of the Tango screening tool to investigate bladder symptoms at night in older people. She's also an executive of the Council of the Australian College of Physiotherapy and we'll talk more about um, specialisation and career pathways for women's and men's health physios, pelvic health physios. Hayley Irving is an APA title continence and women's health physiotherapist and advanced practice physiotherapist in urogyne clinics at Monash Health. She's the current president of the Victorian Physiotherapy Chapter of the Continence Foundation of Australia. And then we have Associate Professor Helena Frawley, who is a specialist continence and women's health physiotherapist and leading clinical researcher at the University of Melbourne lots of them here, uh, with her most recent projects investigating pelvic pain and pelvic floor dysfunction in women with endometriosis and pelvic floor muscle training for women following gynaecological cancer. So thank you, all of your pan the panellists, for giving up your time tonight to be able to discuss some of the sorts of questions that we're going to be thinking about with the direction of uh, women's and men's health and pelvic health physiotherapy. So what we'll do for the next half an hour is we'll be asking the panellists some questions and getting them to respond to the questions. And when we finish that part of the evening, then we'll ask you, for the audience, for some questions. So if you have some burning questions while the panellists are talking, if you could just hold those questions until at the, after the panellists have finished, that would be great. OK. So we're going to start off with Rowan on the end there. So Rowan, it's World Continence Week, following closely on from Men's Health Week this last week. Bins for Blokes and the Great Dunny Hunt are two great public health initiatives that the Continence Foundation has led. Can you tell us a bit about the direction of the Foundation from a policy or health promotion perspective in the next few years? Thanks very much. I have to say that uh, it is World Continence Week and it, I'm very proud every year of everything that happens in World Continence Week and there's so many people around the room that contribute each year to what the Foundation does. I would just like to say quickly a big thank you to Marg for allowing me to share tonight with family and friends and colleagues. It's very special for me, so thank you. Uh, and, and also, uh, if we were daunted by the challenges many, many years ago, we wouldn't all be here, would we? So it is a busy time and I think that from a World Continence Week perspective, our two main focuses for this year have been men's health and uh, the Bins for Blokes campaign and the aim of that is to get disposal bins into men's toilets so they're able to get out of the house and dispose of uh, pads when they need to, to reduce the stigma and socialise people. So that's a very important uh, campaign that we've had a lot of success with and a lot of pledges to support. And uh, we'll, that'll be followed on very quickly by a female, female health campaign in, uh, later in the year with uh, Women's Health Week. So we're a whole of life organisation, big, big remit to try and fulfil everyone's needs and to support. But we're very proud of where what we've done. And I have to say that Mark's been a very much a part of my uh, base of people I have who have contributed to the foundation, be it as a member many, many years ago, or as uh, even as part of uh, being on the journal, uh, the Australian and New Zealand Continents Journal, as a committee member and a past editor. So I thank her continuously for her contribution. She's been fantastic. I'm just being very brief today to talk about where to from here, but I think that what we've got with the Continents Foundation is an organisation that's existed for over 30 years, and it's. Uh, really been dependent on members such as people that are in the audience today. I look around and see people straight away that I can see have been around for a long time. Nothing wrong with that, guys. Don't be mm. embarrassed that we have been here for a while. 
it is time to almost <coughs> hand over the baton in many ways, and I'm, I'm pleased that we're able to do that. However, the foundation will continue to, to exist to support the, uh, the Australian community, and our primary um, focus is to re reduce the stigma of incontinence. We may never get rid of incontinence, but we can certainly make it much easier for people to live with, experience it, get, get it better managed, or even treat it, which is what, what we hope is the best outcome. So our ambition for the, uh, and our future fo focus in um, policy is that we're looking at prevention and um, prevention and early intervention. We're looking at targeted work with at-risk groups and uh, vulnerable communities. We're looking at standards for safe quality care for people. We're working on national standard development at the moment. Workforce capacity building, so that's for specialist and non-specialist and informal carers. People at home looking after their parents. How do we manage? How do we support? How can we help them to cope and manage? Because times are changing and people are going to be at home in, at home for a long time and we need to support that group. We need improved data collection and also understand the impact of incontinence much better and we've often resorted to depending on the Deloitte's report from 2010. I mean, how old's that? Mm -hmm. So we're currently actually just about to embark on a new impact study and that will uh, supersede the Deloitte's report and we're very excited about launching that project very, very soon. Probably one of the really important ones that I'd like to see kick-started is in follow-up to the National Continents Management Strategy, how long ago was that? Uh, we did a lot of research in a period of about 10 years and, and a lot of good work was done, but we need to revise our, our research agenda and we need to set the scene for the next 10 and 20 years. What do we need to know for the future? We've got new innovation coming, we've got new digital uh, technology, we've got innovation, and we've got telehealth, for example. How do we make the best of what is being the future for us? Now, it might be a little bit past me, maybe, but I want to set the scene so that I can also uh, move forward and get people to take the baton and see the future of the Continents Foundation, but they can only do it with the people that are sitting in the audience to support because you're what makes the membership and you're the ones that drive the ambition. So it is an ambitious policy setting that the foundation and the board have actually set for themselves, but with all the support of members and specialists and physios and nurses right across Australia, we will achieve it. So thank you very much for having me today. Thanks so much, Rowan. And if you haven't downloaded the, uh, the great Dunny Hunt, please do so. I certainly downloaded it for my parents just recently. Um, so great initiatives, public health initiatives. So um, there may be some questions a wee bit later. So our next panellist that we'll direct some questions to is Helena. <laughs> So, Helena, your recent research has focused on pelvic pain and pelvic floor dysfunction in endometriosis and also telehealth delivering interventions for women with gynae cancer. I've got a couple of questions for you, Helena. The first one being, how do you see translating that research into practice? Um, and then we might ask you about where the directions might be for research and can't really answer that one very quickly. Um, and then how do we get some of these new people involved in pelvic health research? Thanks, Deb. Yes, there are two projects that I'm doing as part of my joint appointment with the Women's, the Mercy and the University. And they're interesting because they're at different parts of the research pipeline, the pelvic pain and endometriosis, where really looking at some foundational questions we don't know much about pelvic floor function in women with pelvic pain and endometriosis. So we're gathering some really early data that we will later translate into testing interventions to see if it works because we don't have nearly as much evidence for effectiveness of our therapies in that condition compared to incontinence and prolapse. So that's at one end of the research spectrum. The other end is our incontinence, uh, treatment of incontinence for women who've had treatment for gynaecological cancer. So in that project, we're applying evidence that is well tested and that we know does work in women who've not had gynaecological cancer. Will it work for women who have? So that's at a much more advanced end of the research translation pipeline. And if we find that it does, then we can implement it into clinical practice. So we're one step away from changing mm -hmm. clinical care in that 
project depending on the results. But with pelvic pain, we're many steps back and so we've got a long research career ahead of us in pelvic pain. Mm. So that probably comes back to one of the other questions. Yeah. So where to f in pelvic health research do you think is really, say, you know, five years or beyond? Yes, well, I guess I could ask two of my PhD students <laughs> who are sitting here, what do they think? Where are they going in two or five years? Hopefully they'll both be through and uh, enjoying their research career as fully-fledged pelvic floor physiotherapists. I think we've, we've got great opportunities now, particularly here at this university, because we have a history and a strength and a depth of supervision in this topic and not many of the other universities around the country have that. So we're very fortunate that we've, we've built this um, group and we're now hope, hopefully leaving a legacy and passing on the research skills for the next generation. So there are opportunities for um, postgraduate research in masters and PhDs and other projects where the clinicians who are really full-time clinicians, for example, the staff at the Women's and the Mercy that I work with, they're choosing not to do a PhD, but they do want to be involved in clinical research. So that, that's my new challenge, I suppose, is how to integrate uh, clinicians who've not had a formal research training pathway, but they do want to be research active. So that's where I think we've, we've got the greatest impact to make. Mm, definitely. I think that's the thing. It's not everybody has the time or the inclination Jesus, yeah. to want to do that research higher degree. Um, so it's great if they can dip their toes in the water somehow. So there are certainly some opportunities. So through mentoring from the Continents Foundation or the APA, Continents Women's Health Group or Pelvic Health Group, um, those sorts of things. Um, so I think that's really important that, that people, physios, are basically still interested and able to, to dip their toes into the water there as well. So some great work coming out there and we really are very, very lucky to have um, such great teams of, of researchers here at the University of Melbourne. Thank you, Helena, and I'm sure there'll be more questions there for you in the, from the audience. So Wendy, you're up next. So your recent research has challenged the notion of nocturia as a nighttime storage symptom and recommending its consideration as a symptom of many different health conditions. What do you think would help primary care clinicians like GPs, geriatricians, pelvic health physios provide pra best practice care for people who present with nocturia? And how could we facilitate this? Thanks very much. So can I take a, just a, a slight deviation here? And I'd like to just remind us that we're all scientists and when we are treating our patients, the questions and the observations we make are the basis of the research that our colleagues or ourselves are then going to conduct. So I'm a physio in the Continents and Women's Health Group from before, but I have no interest in muscles or movement. This is terrible, isn't it? So. <laughs> I, I was interested in why children that had bladder problems didn't receive treatment. And so my first 25 years of, of clinical research was trying to tease that out and, and work out a, a paradigm so that we could assess and treat children. So then I returned to Australia and I'm interested in why is it that when we treat people with the overactive bladder that frequency and urgency gets better but nocturia doesn't. And then we have to go on and work out, oh yes, that's because, if you think it through, there are many backdoor pathways to that symptom beyond men's and women's pelvic health. And so a convoluted answer is to encourage all of us to say, well, our skill set is infinite, actually, and we can apply our ways of thinking and reasoning to the, the observations we make. And so this um, nocturia body of work has come about because we're actually not getting good results with that symptom, treating them under the model that we had been treating other lower urinary tract symptoms. And so we have worked out, we have joined an international group and we have worked out a good a systematic way of assessing and intervening. We've written a paper for GPs, the questions you should ask someone with nocturia, and we've exploded what might be a traditional physiotherapy approach to take into account that, that this bladder at night time sits inside a body that's comorbid, and that because we are scientists, we understand that, and we need to just broaden out to address the other things that don't move, that aren't muscles, but also are well within our remit of um, understanding and developing. 
So the take home, what do we do in the future, mm. is we look much bigger than the traditional corridor that we might be taught on the excellent course that's here, and we go, but why? And then we explode that out to develop our profession into paediatrics, into endometriosis, into men, into all sorts of areas that uh, we can very credibly walk and uh, hold our heads high and develop research and new techniques. Mm. Well, big areas to, to head. Um, Thank you. And it, it, we don't have to be interested in muscles all the time. <laughs> yes, we do. All right. More movement. <laughs> okay. So next we're headed over to Hayley and Elise. Now, your roles involve leading teams of pelvic health physios in public and private health sectors. And I might get uh, Hayley to speak first in a moment. What do you see as some of the key challenges that clinicians and health services are experiencing and the future perceived needs in those settings? Thanks, Deb. Um, I think the current challenge, which we've all probably faced, especially in public health, has we've all taken a big hit with COVID. Um, a lot of our services have been closed down and hopefully up and running, but still probably not up to 100%. So there's still some immediate challenges there. Um, but I guess the themes that we're hearing as well tonight is a lot about translation um, and prevention. And I think that's our, our job in public health is to, we need to be doing more with less always. Um, but yeah, how do we translate this evidence from these great minds, these amazing shoulders that we stand on um, and ensuring that we get the best care to our patients um, as well as prevention. And I think one of the keys is and I'm sorry, students that have just finished your last exam, but you can't <laughs> stop now. Um, I think we're hearing that from Marg's experience that um, you are coming out with this amazing knowledge and the course is just absolutely fantastic. Um, but that's our job as clinicians is how do we get better at translating those skills, refining those skills um, and improving those skills because it continues. Like I'm sure Marg can attest, it's still an ongoing process even for her. So really establishing good supervision frameworks. And in public health, we do that really well, especially in Victoria and at Monash Health, we do. Um, and and sharing, sharing those as well. So good supervision frameworks, good competency um, frameworks as well. Um, again, we've got some great research coming out about the use of competencies as well to make sure that we are getting that translation and that uptake of the skills. Um, I guess the second thing in terms of making sure we do um, more with less is the, is the sharing of resources. Again, we, we've got the research to, to be using those resources. And this is, I think, a culture that Marg has very much set. I know for me, when I was a real junior physio coming into our interdepartmental meetings in Melbourne, um, Marg was always really generous and leading that culture of, um, let's not reinvent the wheel, let's share our competencies, let's share our procedures, let's share our resources. Um, and that's something that I'm very passionate about in the role with CFA and um, through public health. And hopefully um, we can see that on the course and with the students as well. So hopefully that's something that we can take forward. Thanks, Hayley. So Elise and also Marg working in private practice. So we might start off with Elise and then Marg if you've got yeah. any comments as well. Sure, I'd probably just like to add that the last few years in private practice has been quite a challenge to adapt to COVID restrictions and also adapting to telehealth where our nature as physios is to want to touch the muscles <laughs> um, and thinking more about what, you know, what can we do online but what, what can't be done online. And so actually really adapting our skills as physios, making sure we take a great history, um, do some functional movement tests and actually give the best intervention we can with the information we can gather um, online. So it's certainly been a challenge, and I definitely think everyone's been got better at it over time. And it's amazing that COVID has actually made us do these types of consultations where we wouldn't normally have done so. But I think there's a lot to be gained that we could move forward with, and particularly for people that need to access um, physiotherapists that perhaps are in regional and remote locations. I think um, telehealth is here to stay and is really useful in certain um, situations and for certain consultations. Thanks, Elise. And Marg has asked not to, not to speak for a moment. I don't moment. know that I can add much more. OK. <laughs> um, Wendy, I'm going to come back to you. So you have a number of hats. And in your role with the Australian College of Physiotherapists and the titling and specialisation process, where do you see the future direction for clinicians wanting to pursue a specialisation pathway and the benefits of this process? 
So the college is the career pathway of the future, full stop. Um, at present, membership is for people who come in at a master's level or above, and that will be that will have a new name in the next few months, I imagine. But at the moment, we call, sort of call it level three. And our vision is that every physio who has then completed a master's will become a member of the college. You can be a member and stay at that level, or you can then go on to meet some core competencies and move to level four, and then you can be considered to go into the specialisation program. Specialisation is a clinical pathway, but there's also a, a pathway that acknowledges that physios don't all do hands-on uh, as their advanced contribution. So there'll be a pathway for research people and there'll be a pathway for managers and leaders. And we're not going to call that a non-clinical pathway, but there will be a bifurcation, if you like. And in the future, the career pathway will be really obviously set out in the undergraduate years, and this is what you do. You do your intern years, and then you work towards becoming a member of the college. You may stay a member of the college, or you may then go on to specialise and become a fellow, or to do the other pathway and become <coughs> a fellow. And so then all the uh, organisation that goes into the college will be represented by people who are titled and people who are specialists specialist slash fellows. And I think that'll give us a much clearer pathway. There's no debate yet about the benefits that will give us in our pay packet. That's to come for the generation after that. But at least have a career pathway where we recognise and we, we refer amongst ourselves to people who have developed more advanced knowledge in one field than the other. I think will be extremely exciting. Hmm. Marg and Elise, can you tell us a little bit more about, from the education perspective, perhaps how the program at the University of Melbourne has changed to develop the future workforce, or, or what needs to happen even going forward? Yeah. You're, you're the next leader. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I do really feel like I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, so I definitely acknowledge um, Marg's mentorship in my growth into the new position. So. I suppose there's three points to talk to in terms of how we've adapted the course. Um, there's technology, titling, and also um, clinical reasoning. So um, we actually launched the Master of Pelvic Health and we actually purposely went with a gender neutral title for our um, degree in 2020, <laughs> right when COVID hit. And so that forced us to rapidly innovate and turn our traditional um, bottoms on seats lectures in a lecture theatre just like this um, to online and also develop all these new ways of learning, um, adapt our learning technology. I'm very grateful for Melbourne Uni for doing a complete IT fit out and renovation of our practical rooms where we can now teach in dual delivery, which means we can have students in the classroom on campus and also live online on Zoom and we had to decide what content was appropriate for that dual delivery mode. And also thank you to Marg that was many late nights and chats um, about having to rapidly ad adapt, but I think being forced to do so has really um, given us some amazing options to make education more accessible for people, um, that you don't have to come to campus for the entire duration. You can um, do some theory from home. And we've just finished actually today a prac exam mm -hmm. for our practical intensive where we focus um, really closely on our actual physical assessment skills. So it's been a rapid adaptation to technology, but there's been huge learning in it and a great, I think, change um, for the program. Um, in terms of titling, we're really excited that Late last year, the APA, our Australian Physio Association, um, awarded our master's degree with titling. So we have confidence that our graduates meet the required competencies of that level three professional. And so our graduates will automatically graduate with that um, recognition within the profession. So that was a huge moment and a lot of hard work. I'd like to acknowledge Robin Brennan's help and Marg as well. It's definitely a team effort. Um, and that just really ensures that our content, the knowledge, the skills, and the application of the knowledge and skills is at a level that the, our professional body recognises. 
um, to give us confidence in our graduates providing um, evidence-based care. And just the final thing I wanted to mention was clinical reasoning, that we've actually developed an entirely new subject. Again, we've made it online, um, utilising actually video. So physiotherapists will send us videos of themselves in clinical practice for peer and tutor review. And that's been a fantastic way to capture people's skills and knowledge and application of their knowledge in real time in the comfort of their clinical setting um, to really um, advance people's clinical reasoning and patient care, and also, again, making sure that this is um, accessible for our students. You can be anywhere in the world um, and complete this subject. Um, so that was an exciting innovation and linked closely with our achievement of titling. So we're very proud of that subject. And thank you also to Marg, um, Sonia Moore, and also Hayley Irving, who's a tutor on that subject as well. So that's all I'd like to say in terms of our innovation. But I really would like to acknowledge Marg and I wouldn't be here without her support um, and help throughout this fantastic COVID roller coaster. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd just like to add uh, onto what Elise said about that new clinical subject. Uh, this is what I was meaning about the changes that we make, the innovations. When necessity hits, what do we do? Uh, what do we, how, how, how dig, deep do we dig? And Elise uh, and Robin, uh, Haley and the team really dug deep and this subject is going to be fantastic and it, just, it really is going to set uh, graduate physios up for a career in, as uh, Wendy was saying, scientists. We're going to look broader, they'll be able to understand how and why we should look broader in our assessment and treatment. So yes, well done Elise. Thanks so much Marg and Elise, but you're right, you've, you've really had to pivot so much in the last couple of years and really think you know, innovatively and change things in response to what's been happening with COVID. Just before we ask for some rounding off things, when you talk about clinical reasoning, for people who are perhaps not continence, women's health, men's health, pelvic health physios, just for myself having come from the musk world and then dipping into the women's health world for a little while, um, you know, if you're a non-women's health physio, you're thinking about what do they mean clinical reasoning? Well, of course you've got a clinical reason everything. You have no idea how complex the area of pelvic health is. So the clinical reasoning at, is at an absolute different level to many other areas in physiotherapy. So um, being able to have a subject devoted to this is incredibly useful. Um, and it, one thing with learning this sort of area, you require so much more mentoring after you have those basic uh, competencies and skills. So this is really key for you to have brought in that sort of subject. So well done you, because we need it in that area, most definitely. Okay, that's enough of that about me. Okay, so... Now what I'd just like to have is um, a rounding off sort of from, from each of our panellists before we'll open up to some questions from the audience. So Rowan, I might get you to start. We might start from the end and work our way back down. So if there is one thing that you could change in the next five years to improve the lives of people with pelvic health conditions, what would it be? Look, I think the, for me the focus is on better access to assessment and to services. It's diminished since the heyday of the early 2000s and the government funding and the multi-D clinics first starting. And if we're not careful, it will disappear very, very quickly. So I guess my focus is on trying to uh, bring the attention back to this with the revised National Continence Action Plan so that we get that funding back into the systems to give access to fair access to everyone. You're here, thank you. Elise. I've only got a small goal. It's to have um, pelvic health physiotherapists in all regional and metro cities <laughs> right across Australia um, to ensure best practice care for um, all women, men, children that need our care. Mm -hmm. Yes, fantastic. Wendy. It's to understand that the bladders and the bowels that we treat actually live inside real people who exist in a different world to what we might understand when they come in 
And that whole hackneyed phrase of biopsychosocial actually means an awful lot. So sometimes it's a valid consultation to sit there and discuss something else right outside the body so that you build the relationship so that you can then move forward with that person where it matters to them. So I think I just, just keep pushing that window and don't feel bad if your consultation is about something that's really important to somebody and you're the person who gets to talk them through that because then you'll be able to get where you want to go. Mm. So true. Hayley. Um, I think that we do a really great job with our patients who do have pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, and I think in the men's health world, we're doing a great job with prevention with our men periprostatectomy and seeing them pre-op. Um, I think we can do better antenatally and seeing women um, during their pregnancy and preventing um, issues postnatally. Oh, I was I going to say that. that. <laughs> <laughs> you know that from the research perspective. Yes, yes exactly. Yeah. But okay, I'll dream up something different. <laughs> um, I guess the oh, more more funding, absolutely. Mm. Um, more funding would be a dream. Shake the money tree. Mm. Um, I think maintaining what we've started. So growing a research culture. Mm in our specialty, because we, we didn't have that before. So we've started it, we've now got some momentum and strength, and I really want that to continue. So we need to keep supporting our research leaders, who will then be able to build a future for the next generation. Mm -hmm. And my single thing is I would like to see a lot earlier understanding of pelvic health, whether it's specifically pelvic floor, bladder and bowel health, in younger women. Uh, when my daughter was at school, I approached her school to see if we could have some pelvic floor education in the year 12 uh, personal development program. I was met with a flat no. Mm -hmm. I would like that to have changed by now. I would like the next generation to approach schools. If we, can we get some early education in pelvic health? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think that's really crucial, isn't it? And to see that, you know, back when you started, Marg, we couldn't even say breast. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but to, to really, you know, humanise things and get it back to the basics. It's the basic functions and basic um, anatomy and, and really normalise things. Um, it's really, really important. And uh, the role of physios is key in that. So I'd like to thank the panellists um, for their responses now. And then if we'd like to open up to some questions from the audience, we have got a couple of roving mics. And could I ask that if you have got a question to call one of the ushers over um, and uh, if you could stand and just say your name with your question, that would be great. And it can be directed to any of the, the panellists or Marg. Who's got a question? Joan. Tara, could you bring the microphone down to Professor McMeekin? Look, thank you all to all of you, um, and especially to Mark. That was fantastic to hear how things have changed over time and how you're all taking pelvic health forward. I'm aware that one of the areas that's probably still challenging is men with prostate cancer. And that can occur when they're quite young, so that a, a young man may have prostate cancer um, and the, have the after effects for another 40 years. So I'm just wondering how strong the inroads are to ensuring that every man who has prostate cancer surgery, or alternatively doesn't have surgery but has other mechanisms to treat it. How widespread is the opportunity for those men to have physiotherapy and continence nursing attention? Hayley, would that be yeah, something I'm you could answer? answer? That was a great question. I think we've Thanks, made John. some great inroads over the last few years, um, especially in public health. We're now at Monash Health, we're working really closely with our prostate cancer nurses. So probably about five or six years ago, Movember, all your funding when you donate to your friends growing moustaches funded some prostate cancer nurses at each major hospital around Victoria. And their job is to purely oversee the men um, throughout their journey with prostate cancer. 
Um, so we team up really closely with them and get the men referred to physiotherapy as soon as they're um, put on the list for a radical prostatectomy. And so we will see them preoperatively um, at least twice. Now we have got um, clearance to use transperineal ultrasound in public health um, with the use of high level disinfection and um, a robust competency program so all our physiotherapists can utilise the transperineal ultrasound. So they're getting best care pre-op, um, which is the evidence um, if we can get those men contracting their muscles preoperatively, they have better outcomes post-operatively. Um, we also talk to them about their sexual health, um, their physical health, their mental health. Um, so the fact that we can get in with them early, sometimes months before their operation, means that we can really make some inroads and if they have any lower urinary tract symptoms, address them before the operation. Um, and then we work really closely with um, the continent service if those men do have ongoing issues where they can get um, access to funding for pads and more continence devices if necessary. So I think it, I feel really positive about that, that area and feel like we are doing a really good job with these men. Thanks, Hayley. And I think just in general, we're really passionate about um, the paradigm of research, education and our clinicians and all working together to make sure that um, we have current content in our courses. We've enhanced our module on pre and post -prost prostatectomy and added more men's health content into our um, degree qualifications. So we're continually evolving, evolving the education component to make sure our new clinicians are actually skilled um, in these emerging areas. I'd like to ask Hayley a question on that. How widespread uh, are services like you've got at Monash? Uh, the question that Joan asked was, yes, where, how much are we doing about it? But, and you've got a really good service at Monash, but where else can men go? What about rural and remote areas? Mm. Yeah, it's a good question, Marg. And we do struggle, I know, in the corridor. Um, for those of you in Melbourne, out further east in Gippsland, we know that there's very limited services. So those men can, um, they need to travel to come to see us. And so that's part of with the CFA physio group, um, looking at funding rural physios to come and do their postgrad through um, Melbourne University. But also what we've done with other health services around Victoria is help them share our resources with them. We've shared our you know, grant applications. I've shared um, all the competencies and, and um, with lots, of, I think with Barwon and with Northern and with Western to try and help them make sure that they can get through their infection control procedures to help them set up their services. Um, so I think we're getting there, yeah. Did you want to say something, Rowan? I just wanted to add that um, part of the bins for blokes uh, campaign this week has been about actually edu educating men through a variety of marketing and communication that they actually have a pelvic floor. Mm. <laughs> you know, we're trying to say it's not the bicep curls, it's not the planks, it's not anything else. You actually have a pelvic floor. And in the multiple interviews that I've had this week, Dennis Walters said to me last night, oh, I've never known that men have a pelvic floor in all mm. my years in radio. And I said, mm. well, you better get us back on again. Mm. So I think it's actually just creating awareness all the time and also to help men to say it's okay to go and talk when you're having problems. We have had an increase in young men calling the helpline uh, about incontinence problems that we've never had before because we've actually started advertising the back of sounds to but back of toilet doors. But that's how you get their awareness while they're just, you know, sitting there <laughs> at times. And um, it, it's about raising awareness. So yeah, it does have some good impact. But we've got to keep going, don't we? Mm. Definitely. Thank you. Oh, is it up the back there? That side. Thank you for um, having us. So this question probably is directed mainly to Wendy. As physios, we can really differentiate between the skill set of a titled physio or a specialist physio or someone who's done a postgrad to someone who is a physio with an interest in women's health or pelvic health. And then as physios, we can look to those people with higher education if we need referral. But I don't think the general public have a very good understanding of this clinician might have a better understanding or, or background or education compared to this physician who might actually be calling themselves a specialist when they're not a specialist. So into the future, is there a, a better way we're going to educate the general public with that pathway? Absolutely, there is. Um, where the plan is at at the moment is inward facing. And once we, I think, understand ourselves 
what these levels mean than we go outward facing, but we make it more simple. Um, our difficulty, of course, is that you can graduate tomorrow and treat anything, um, and the fee structure might be the same if you're in private practice, for example. So there's a lot of discussion on College Council about how we're going to address that, and there's no definitive answer yet, but it's, it's acknowledged, and it is going to be one of our challenges in the future. Thank you. Um, Gillian Webb, oh, well, well, just me to finish. Um, thanks, Marg, very much. Um, you reminded me that actually I learnt to do vaginal examinations in your house. <laughs> um, those vendors. <vengeance. laughs> Not on you, of course. And um, also, you know, the changing shape, you know, the mentoring that you did through changing shape and, you know, the lycra we all wore. Um, I guess I, I don't have so much a question, but I do want to wave the little bow flag. You know, we're doing great research in bladders, um, prolapse, now pelvic pain, but I think the bowel research is lagging behind big time. There's so much out there that needs um, to be done. Um, so I'm, I'm encouraging, you know, all, the, all, of the, all of you who are in charge of educating and encouraging researchers um, to continue to, to not forget about the bowel. Um, and I guess my other um, thing is, you know, we, we're all seeing lots of pelvic floor dysfunction. Can we prevent it? I mean, mm. obviously there's a lot of work in the antenatal, postnatal world, and, and um, Helena, you're doing the endometriosis. But I, I hope in the future we can actually, you know, find out who, who's susceptible and can we nip it in the bud. That would be great. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Ange. Uh, and I Professor think that's Webb why my um, one item for the future is uh, get the girls and boys when they're young. Yes. Uh, educate them young. Uh, and maybe we can ha prevent some of the cases occurring. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks very much. Um, I've just taken up a position at the University of Tasmania who are starting a program. And I want to know, are there guidelines for what is expected to be taught in a graduate for an entry level in women's health and men's health. Are there competencies? Otherwise, if not, you'll all be coming to Tasmania to be teaching in the program there. <laughs> so that's quite all right. I'm very happy about that. But are there, have there been defined, I mean, you've defined things for specialisation. What about down at the new grad level? Um. I'm not actually aware of any mandated requirements <coughs> in women's, men's and pelvic health and we're definitely proud to have it as part of the curriculum at Melbourne Uni but I do know that it does differ quite widely across Australia. So more than happy to chat about what we can do to help you set up. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, the APA does have, uh, in uh, setting out levels one, two, three and four, has competencies uh, for each of the levels, a new grad and experienced. There, there's someone with an interest in women's, uh, women's, men's and pelvic health, then the title level and specialist. So they are written down within the APA. Yeah, but that's for graduates, yeah, yeah. not undergraduates. Yeah. No, yeah. but at the level one is what a graduate should come out yeah, with. Yeah, right at the end, mm -hmm. yeah, good point. Mm -hmm. So certainly the APA sounds like the, the Go sort the of APA. that entry to practice. Oh, you are the APA. <laughs> <laughs> it will be important. Uh, we've probably got time for one last question. Somebody's got a burning question at the back here. So, thanks, Bridget's coming with the microphone. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Mark. Um, for all of your work. Um, my question is around research because there's discussion around the future and um, developing physios into research. Um, I guess what are the key areas that should be researched that haven't yet? Um, is there anything burning that we haven't started but someone really should? <laughs> we do want to finish sometime this evening. <laughs> Oh, Helena. Well, I'm sure, sure we'd all have something to say about yes. that. Um, I don't know a short answer, but mm. a principle would be what's important. Mm. So in order to identify what do we research, we have to work out what's the gap and what's an important gap. So it's a couple of steps that we need to go through. And that will be different depending on people's priorities and contexts. And 
many other variables. But slightly linked to that question, one of the other things that I was thinking has emerged over the last few years, which I don't think we had before in pelvic health, was this nexus between teaching, research and clinical practice. I don't think we had that 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. But I think it's really emerging now. And I think that's fantastic. And I think that's how we will work out what to research next. We keep talking to each other and our research should inform our education, which informs clinical practice, which raises the questions back to research that we don't know the answers to. And we hear from the clinicians what's important. And then what have we got funds to do? And you know, how do we uh, justify that? So I think that nexus is really important and we should keep developing it. And I think it will help answer that question. So keep in touch with Helena. <laughs> So stay passionate. Yeah. Keep that enthusiasm going. So anyone that's just finished the course, then keep at it. Um, and uh, it's, it's exciting. Really, really and exciting. <laughs> Angela, you would be really happy to know that um, Elisa's expanded the bowel part of the course. So we've spent the whole day examining bowels. <laughs> <laughs> the non-pelvic health <laughs> physios in the room. <laughs> and, and that's why <laughs> and definitely from the, the master's course point of view, we do have a pathway where students can identify themselves as clinicians or um, really have that passion for research and they can choose a professional project that's based in their clinical context or they can choose a research project. So there's definitely a pathway from our master's program if you're interested in um, pursuing something towards a, a PhD. Well, thank you very much, panel. Um, now, before we conclude for the evening, I want to thank you all very much for your expertise and sharing um, some of your insights into women's health physio and the role that Marg, the amazing Marg Sherbin, has had um, in women's health physiotherapy and contribution to the profession. Don't get me started. So um, thank you very much, all of you, for being here this evening and contributing to that. Um, before we um, adjourn for some nibblies outside, we do have a little video that we'd like to show. Hello Marg, I just want to say a huge thank you for all that you did for all of those years at the Women's to help shape the physiotherapy team into what it is today. Uh, I also want to thank you for inspiring so many physios here in Victoria, across the country and really across the world for following a path into pelvic floor physiotherapy. And then finally from me personally, um, I want to genuinely thank you for being such a generous, kind, loyal uh, and incredibly funny friend for all of these years. So, um, Marg, a huge congratulations on your retirement and um, all the best for the future. Vern always knew she wanted to be a physio and she graduated in 1970 and she was back teaching by 1975. She ran a clinical practice in women's health and exercise. In the 1990s, the APA Women's Health Physios and I wanted to start a postgraduate course. We were successful and Marg was in the earliest cohort. Since then, Marg has taught Women's Health Physiotherapy to many, many national and international students. It has been one of the most successful courses and Marg has given a huge amount of her time to keep women healthy. Thank you very much, Marg. Hi, Marg. I'm looking forward to your retirement celebration. And I'd like to say congratulations on a long and wonderful career and all you've done for our specialty. Your enthusiasm has inspired so many. I'm looking forward to celebrating with you in person at the retirement event next week. Dear Mark, greetings from the world's end, the summer house where you have been. 
It's so sad that you are retired from physiotherapy, women's health, and pelvic floor. You are namely the, one of the best physiotherapists in the world when it comes to science, having a scientific mind and also your knowledge of anatomy, physiology, and exercise science is superb. I really admire all your work. Thank you so much for inviting me to stay at Melbourne University for three months with you and Helena, and also to be your supervisors for your PhD. It's been a great pleasure working with you, and I will certainly miss you professionally, but also as a friend. And I hope that we can keep this friendship open through the years to come. Thank you so much, Mark. Congratulations on a great academic and clinical career. You should be really proud of the women's health course that you established, which has led to many women's health physios out there in the profession. Well done from your lifelong partner. Hi, Mum. Congrats on an amazing career at Melbourne Uni. You've achieved so much while you've been there, from pioneering new courses, presenting great lectures, making it a wonderful childcare for sick kids not at school, completing a master's and a PhD with vivid, vivid memories of late night editing sessions, amongst many other things. What a whirlwind of an adventure. Enjoy your well-earned retirement. Congratulations, Mum, on an amazing career. You should be really proud of everything you've achieved. You've always followed your passions and you've made a difference to so many people's lives, which is inspirational to us all. We, look, we wish you a great retirement and we're looking forward to lots of G&Ts in the sun. And what do we say, everyone? Congratulations! Congratulations! Mark, we've worked together clinically at the women's and also teaching throughout the physio course at the University of Melbourne, including the women's health area. We've taught overseas, we've had some great times, and I really thank you for including in, me in your journey and congratulate you on your amazing achievements. Congratulations, Marg, on your semi-retirement from Melbourne Uni. Well done on such a fabulous career, helping so many young people develop their women's um, health skills. Your reach has been phenomenal, and your roles at the Royal Women's Hospital, the University of Melbourne, the Contents Foundation are renowned nationally and internationally. I'd like to say a personal thanks as well for being my mentor at Melbourne University and you've taught me so much and helped me along the way. Like I can only hope to stand on your sh shoulders and continue to develop the future of women's, men's and pelvic health physiotherapy. Thanks, Marg, and enjoy the next adventure. Hi, Marg, on behalf of the Continents Foundation, the board, the membership, and from me personally, thank you so much for your contribution and support in the sector over the last 30 plus years. Congratulations and enjoy your retirement. Hello, my friend. I'm so sad I can't be there with you tonight to help celebrate your special occasion, but I am there in spirit. I just wanted to say congratulations on a wonderful career. It's been such a pleasure and a privilege to have worked with you over the years. We had heaps of fun and we did some pretty cool, cool stuff. I know this is no retirement for you. This is just the beginning of new adventures. And I really wish you well in everything that you do. We'll miss you. But enjoy this evening, dance a lot, drink lots of wine. Cheers! That was lovely. Thank you, everyone who contributed. Thank you. I think the one word that kept being repeated was fun. <laughs> and that is something, when I, whenever I talk, used to talk to people about, oh, you know Marg, don't you? She's the one that's 60 going on 30, you know? <laughs> because she will always have fun, the passion, the fun. And I think that's what made, one of the things that made Marg so wonderful to work with. So thank you very much. Now we do have a little presentation for you, Marg, if you'd like to pop up. Um, and I'd like to ask our Head of Department to present Marg with a gift. Wow, Marg, what a just a stunning, stunning evening learning about um, all that you've done. Now I get the greatest privilege on behalf of the Department 
interest in presenting you with a special gift of artwork from First Nations artist Deborah Young Nakamara, and her work is titled Women's Ceremony, which you can see up here up front. And this artwork was chosen with input from our own Mel Smith, who from her Indigenous lens noticed when looking at the artist's work and that of her prolific family, that much of their artwork focuses on the collaboration between women. In this piece, we see the stunning colours and the heavy dot work are used to depict traditional sacred women's sites in the Kintor area, which is located 250 kilometres from Deborah's um, uh, from, from, De from Deborah and her ancestors. And the connecting lines between the circles are the ancient, ancient travelling paths that leads to these sites. We'd like to present you with this artwork, Marg. It's just a small token of gift from all of us in the Department of Physiotherapy and beyond. Thank you so much, everybody. Look, I've had a wonderful night. I feel my ego is going to be so big, I won't be able to get out the door. <laughs> but I feel so appreciative of your coming here tonight um, for this gift, for the support that I've had over the years, because you don't get to a position like this without help. And you, you need colleagues, you need people to share offices with, you need people to pour your heart out to, you need people to laugh with and dance with and have another glass of wine with. Jenny was a really good conference buddy for that. <laughs> uh, so it, with, with that comes a huge thank you to the University of Melbourne Physiotherapy School of Health Sciences for providing such a good workplace that I could achieve what I wanted to achieve. I'd like to thank the Women's Hospital for providing the opportunity to expand physiotherapy. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues for supporting me for so long, the, the conferences, the, the weeks we had uh, learning to do things. Uh, there are so many people to thank, uh, particularly the people who took the time to record the video. Uh, very special thanks to you. So I will say farewell for the moment for you all and look forward to having a, a, a social time with you outside and a supreme thank you to Fiona and the team at Physiotherapy for such a thoughtful gift. This is really uh, very thoughtful. It's, uh, it will have a pride of place on, in my home. So thank you very much everybody. Um, and good luck, all you youngsters who've done the course, uh, who are out there, expand your horizons and enjoy every moment of your women's health, pelvic health career. Thank you. So much and thank you very much again to our panellists and all of our guests who have come this evening. Now I'm in trouble because we're 10 minutes late for the caterers so please go out and into the foyer and do start um, having some nibbles and a drink and enjoy Marg's celebration and thank you all so much for coming. Not Marg.